Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael Kilpatrick here. I am here with John Kemp, who is the founder and leader at Advancing Eco Agriculture in Ohio, in Northeastern Ohio. So John is the founder of Advancing Eco Agriculture, a plant nutrition and biostimulants company, biostimulants consulting company, a top expert in the field of biological and regenerative farming. John founded AEA in 2006 to help fellow farmers by providing the education tools and strategies that will have a global effect on the food supply and those who are growing that supply. John is a, a fellow podcaster with the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast, where he interviews top scientists and growers about the science and principles of implementing regenerative agriculture on a large scale. Welcome, John. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So give us an overview of kind of like your, um, the company as it stands right now. The company as it stands right now, mostly works with commercial scale fruit and vegetable growers and increasingly a lot of broad acre crops in the mid Mm. across the Midwest. So uh, do a lot of work with commercial scale fruit and vegetable production in Washington, California, and the Southeast. And what we've really become known for in that particular context is helping producers make more money by producing higher quality fruit that has better storability, firmness, shelf life, whatever the characteristics are that increase profitability, and by also contributing significant disease and insect resistance. And now we're bringing that to broad acre crops as well, starting to do a lot of work with, uh, I have have for some time actually, last half a dozen years, done a lot of work with forages and grain crops. Mm. So when you say the Southeast, are you talking about things like the peach, the peach areas? Um, strawberries in California and citrus and some of the fun ah. stuff that's going on in Florida and so forth. Yeah. Interesting. So give us a little bit about your background. How did you get started in the mm-hmm. farming world? I grew up on a family fresh market vegetable farm in here in Northeast Ohio. We were in the snow belt and south of Lake Erie. Well, fairly high humidity, high rainfall during the summer months, upwards of 90 inches of snowfall accumulation. And all of that contributed to the typical season. We would experience a lot of disease and insect pressure, particularly disease pressure. We were very conventional mainstream growers. I was a licensed pesticide applicator when I was 16 years old. My dad was the pesticide distributor for the local region. So as a result, we were the first people to try all the newest, latest and greatest combinations and cocktails. Mm. Then in the early 2000s, we started growing vegetables in 94. In the early 2000s, 2002, 3, and 4, we had a three-year consecutive period in which we had severe disease and insect pressure that we were not successful in managing and controlling with pesticides. Mm. And in the third year of that three-year period, we started renting a field from a neighboring farm that had been a small dairy farm with a corn, small grain, and hay rotation that bordered right up against one of our own fields. And now that we were farming both of them, we started planting crops across the field border. At harvest time, that field was planted into cantaloupe. At harvest time, the field with a prior decade of intense pesticide applications had 80% of the leaves infected with powder mildew. Mm. And on the new soil, there was no powder mildew. You couldn't find any. And that really was kind of a light bulb moment for me. I wanted to learn about what were the differences between those two plants and what allowed one to be resistant when the next plant literally two feet away was susceptible. Same variety, everything was identical, but completely different outcome. And from that, asking those questions, doing a lot of reading and studying and having an exceptional group of mentors to work with, um, that then led to founding Advancing Eco Agriculture in 2006, initially only as a consulting company, and then At that time, the product landscape was very different from what it is today, and I became very frustrated with our inability to get good results from products in the field. And I made a comment that I could make better stuff on my own than most of what was available. And several people encouraged me to start doing that. So that's flash forward to today where AEA is a products and consulting company. Uh, We still have that very strong consulting background and pedigree and share a lot of information widely and freely. And, but then we also have developed the products to help 
support turning that vision into a reality in the field. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let's talk about a little of the overarching AEA principles. Like when you start working with someone or when you like approach just a farm in general, what are those principles that you start with? Well, the principles that I get really excited about, kind of the, the principles of regenerative agriculture and what inspires me and what I'm so passionate about is the idea that we can develop agricultural systems which deliver three promises. First, uh -huh. they produce crops that are completely resistant to diseases and insects. And by completely resistant, I mean precisely that. I mean 100% resistant to everything, including Colorado potato beetles and Japanese beetles and cucumber beetles and squash bugs, et cetera, et cetera, and locusts as well. Okay. And thus eliminate the need for pesticides. The second promise is that when we grow plants that have such a functional level of immunity, they also transfer that resistance to the people and the livestock who consume that as food. And we can uh -huh. have a legitimate conversation about growing food as medicine. Third, when we grow plants with this extraordinary level of health, they also very rapidly sequester carbon and build soil organic matter. And we can regenerate soil very quickly, regenerate soil health very quickly while we are growing a plant and while we're growing a crop. So those are the three goals and um, objectives that are possible that I'm mm -hmm. really passionate about. When I became, when I realized that we can have agricultural systems which deliver all three of those things at once, what I'm personally really passionate about is I want to have those systems become the mainstream, become the status quo globally against which everything else is compared by 2040. And I believe uh -huh. that's a very realistic and achievable goal. We're well on the pathway to achieving that goal. Uh -huh. So with those three uh, promises, what's the fastest way that you can get there? So what do you guys do when you come onto a farm to start achieving that? When we first begin working with a farm, we do a thorough systems analysis of what is going on with nutrition and biology and nutrient applications. So we look at soil analysis, the soil's capacity to deliver nutrients. We look at irrigation water quality, if that's relevant. Um, we look at the actual measured plant absorption of nutrients using plant sap analysis. Uh -huh. and. Then we look also at the disease and insect pressure that is present, the weed pressure that is present, because all of these are indicators. Every disease that is present is an indicator of a specific nutritional profile. Insects are indicators of specific nutritional profiles. And weeds are indicators of nutritional and biological profiles of what's going on in the soil. So we look at all of these um, laboratory assays and bioassays and bioindicators, and that gives us a very detailed profile of what's happening in this ecosystem from both a nutrition and a biology perspective. And from that, we'll put together a set of recommendations that includes uh, recommendations for any needed soil amendments, for what types of cover crops to use, for what types of microbial inoculants to use, types of compost to use, um, types of foliar applications and fertigation applications to use, everything that fits into the context of what is practical and realistic for that farming operation. So you might have two farms side by side growing similar crops, but the, the, the recommendations might be completely different based on the capacity and the goals of those growers and what they desire to achieve. Uh -huh. Gotcha. So do you feel that SAP analysis will become more mainstream as more people adopt this? <laughs> if you would have asked me that question, six or seven years ago, I would have answered without any hesitation, absolutely yes. Okay. And it's been really intriguing to observe how SAP analysis has, uh, the path that it has taken. I played a um, major role in bringing it here, making it available here in North America. We run thousands of samples per month throughout the entire growing season from many of the different crops that we work with. SAP analysis has been an incredibly powerful tool for us, and it is so sensitive and so accurate that I believed when we first started testing it and playing with it back in 2011, uh -huh. that it would rapidly become the mainstream and displace tissue analysis. Yeah. What has actually happened is it is so sensitive, it's so accurate. Many significant players, some of the largest plant nutrition providers in the world, a number of them have used SAP analysis. They've used it in large enough that they have a, they've had a lot of experience with it. 
and they all stopped. And I tried to uncover and understand why it was that they discontinued the use of SAP analysis. And I discovered there were two reasons. The first reason was that it showed growers didn't actually need the product they were trying to sell. Uh. And the second reason was it showed that the product that was applied didn't actually deliver results. So that was the discontinuation of SAP analysis being widely used by fertilizer distributors. And to me, uh, I would say those exact two points are significant selling points, selling factors for why every grower should be using SAP analysis independently of their agronomist. Yeah. So is so. Let's talk about. Let's break down a little bit of what those companies are selling. Are they just selling the normal PNK fertilizers? And because that's not what the plant needs, they weren't able to sell more of that. Yes, that and also trace mineral products. Um, my observation and experience has been that many of the trace mineral products that are available in the marketplace also don't actually deliver plant results. Mm. And is that because they're just made poorly or they're not applied correctly? Uh, it can be application, but in many cases, it's because they are not formulated correctly and they're not formulated well. Mm -hmm. um, and examples would be particularly the trace mineral metals, uh, manganese and iron and copper and cobalt uh, need to be in the right oxidation state for plants to absorb them well. And if they are not in the right oxidation state, then you can apply an unlimited quantity, or I shouldn't say unlimited quantity, but a very large quantity and achieve no crop response. And that is what most companies and most growers are using because it's the least expensive. Okay, so this is where we start to get into the EH and redox with the oxidation state? Yes. Okay. Yeah, right. so I've been, I, I find it intriguing that there is so much importance and so much value placed on understanding of pH and having a balanced soil pH, and yet there is so little conversation around EH or redox. Okay. And it's, it is a big topic. It's like trying to explain pH in just a few minutes. It's difficult to explain it coherently. We know that pH is essentially a measurement of acidity versus alkalinity uh -huh. and has a scale of from zero to 14. EH or redox is a measurement of oxidation versus reduction and has different scales, um, one from zero to 42, but also other scales depending on the unit of measure that you're using. The important point <clears throat> is simply that nutrient availability for crops and also biological activity is influenced at least as much, if not more, by EH and redox than it is by pH. So it's not necessarily that one is more important than the other, but both of them are important to know and understand. And uh, so I've been studying EH and its implications for soil health and plant health for some time. And there's a fascinating researcher uh, in French, Olivier, France, Olivier Husson, who uh -huh. has written pretty much all of the papers that make coherent sense on the topic uh, as related to agricultural ecosystems. And I actually hosted him on the podcast a few episodes ago, and we also put together a long, a six hour long course on the academy that is available for free. And people have been listening to this. We made it available for free because it's such an important topic uh -huh. and people really need to understand because when you, the, the simple way of saying it is that EH and PH are kind of these macro indicators of the sum totality of what is happening with soil biology and nutrient availability. And when those are balanced, you can achieve complete disease and insect resistance. And being able to identify where you are gives you the controls to guide you to where you want to go. And you can, not only can you predict disease and insect susceptibility, but now you can also prevent it. Interesting. So if you can come in with a soil test and see that no matter what you do, you're going to have some issues, you know that um, you know how to manage it better down the road. Yes. You know how to manage not just your product applications, but also your cultural management. Mm -hmm. Do you want to keep your soils more wet and irrigate more? Do you want to keep them drier? Um, should you grow certain types of cover crops that have a reducing effect or other types of cover crops that have an oxidizing effect. So it can really have a significant impact on cultural management practices.
mm -hmm. that can influence oxidation and reduction. Okay, so is there a test for that? I mean, I don't, you don't see that on a normal soil test, correct? There is a test for it, and it's largely valueless because it is such an unstable metric. It's just an unstable number. And this is one reason why not more research has been done about it and why it's not more widely discussed. Mm. Because when you talk about uh, reduction versus oxidation, um, example, so oxidation is just natural weathering. Mm -hmm. It's called soil weathering, or when you take a piece of metal and you expose it to rain and sunlight, it begins oxidizing. That's rust, mm -hmm. um, which is what is happening with many of our soils. They're excessively oxidized. And then um, examples of very reduced environments would be um, yogurt or sauerkraut or apple cider vinegar or a blueberry bog mm -hmm. or a rice paddy or cranberry bog. These are all very reduced environments. And all those that I mentioned, the one thing they all have in common is anaerobic fermentation. So we can talk about oxidation and reduction. Mm -hmm. And there's a parallel of speaking about aerobic versus anaerobic. And when we have very reduced environments, they are often also anaerobic environments. Not always, but they're often also anaerobic environments in, in biological systems. So it's possible, uh, let's say you have soil that is quite dry and you take a reading and it shows that you're you, you have a reading of let's say um 30 and you're quite oxidized if you get a two inch rainfall the number changes completely in 24 hours because the soil is now much more wet uh -huh. and has a lot more water in it so because of that very rapid variability it's difficult to measure and manage well and so the key point is not that it's so also biology. We know that we have some organisms that thrive in anaerobic environments and others uh -huh. that thrive in aerobic environments and some that are in between. There's, the point is that there is a spectrum. It's not black and white. It's not zero and one, but we have this broad range of EH similar to what we have a broad range of pH. And we have biology that live on different spots all along this spectrum. Some of these some of this biology has a very strong disease suppressive effect and, and is beneficial to plants. And others are, have the potential to become pathogens depending on the soil environment. So the key is not to manage the chemistry of EH and pH redu reduction and oxidation because it changes so quickly based on water levels and so forth. The key is to manage the soil's biology so that we have the majority of the soil biology living in the correct EH zone. And okay. when that happens, you, you now have disease suppressive soils, you now have increased trace mineral availability because these bacteria that live in this zone have a very strong reducing effect. They have the effect of converting oxidized iron, which is rust, back into reduced iron that plants can absorb. So it's not so much a conversation about managing the chemistry as it is about managing your biological profile. Uh-huh. Okay. So let's talk about, let's say, a small-scale farm that's doing, like, baby greens. I talked to a grower yesterday who's going to be on the podcast, and he's doing, like, six rotations of baby greens one after another in the field. Would he use something like sap analysis to be testing on that, or how would you recommend him figuring out what his soils need? The way that I think about soil analysis and plant sap analysis, uh, soil analysis are a valuable and necessary tool. We use them on all the farms that we work on, but um, they have a few flaws. Uh, the significant flaw is that they are based exclusively on understanding chemistry. And when you look at how plants actually absorb nutrients, um, there, there are two models of plant nutrition. The one model is that plants can absorb simple ions from the soil solution, nitrate and ammonium and calcium and potassium and magnesium ions, etc. The other model, the one that, this, and this is the way that nature really works in non-domesticated systems, is that plants absorb nutrition directly from microbes and from microbial metabolites. So they can consume whole bacteria and internalize entire bacteria within the roots. They can absorb microbial metabolites such as peptides, proteins, amino acids, organic acids directly from the soil profile. And so when plants, our modern agriculture has adopted the framework of 
the absorption of simple ions, which has led to a very strong chemistry analysis of the soil. We focus on balancing nutrients based on a chemistry profile. Uh -huh. But we don't really take into consideration plants absorption of these, all these other microbial metabolites. So from that foundational challenge flows the challenge of laboratory analytics today in that often the soil test is referred to as a roadmap. We know where we want to go. We know what the ideal mineral ratios and mineral levels are. And a soil test shows us where we are at. And now we can figure out how to get from A to B. Only there's a problem. The problem is that there is no indication whether any of the pathways or any of the roads on the map or on the atlas is an interstate or a township highway, uh -huh. or a, a township road that is a bit more than a cow path. Uh -huh. So <clears throat> we have, there are many farmers and growers and many agronomists with a lot of experience who can describe how you have soils you can have soils that have high levels of calcium, but the crops are calcium deficient. Uh -huh. Soils have high levels of magnesium, but the crops are magnesium deficient, or phosphorus, or potassium, or manganese, or iron. Kind of the list goes, there's quite an extensive list of nutrients for which this is true. Uh -huh. So the challenge is that you can have abundant levels of nutrients showing up on a soil report, but they are not being absorbed by plants as a result of dysfunctional biology. So the way that I think about soil analysis is they're a valuable and necessary tool, and we need to also fact check them. We need to identify of these nutrients which are high or adequate on the soil report, is the crop actually absorbing them? Uh -huh. So I perceive the, the crop to be the final report card of truth checking what's actually happening, what's actually going on. And this is where the SAP analysis is useful and a necessary tool. Okay. is that it can show us that the, that the plant is actually absorbing the nutrients or not that are showing up on the soil report. Okay. So you would recommend someone who's doing like greens every 21 days to SAP analysis test what looks like what it comes in as perfect. Like, oh my gosh, this better greens was beautiful. Test that. Mm -hmm. So you see what they're actually getting and then test stuff that looks really poor and say, okay, what is this not getting? And then going back to that soil test and seeing how they all interact. Yes, there is that. And then there is also, um, there is the perception that um, SAP analysis is a tool to be used to make corrections in the present growing cycle. We want to pull a SAP analysis, check the uh, nutrient profile, and then make corrections with foliar applications or whatever uh -huh. to balance the mineral profile in the current growing cycle. And okay. it's certainly very valuable as a tool for that, but that is not the most important use. The most important use is to change the way you manage nutrition and biology for the next growth cycle. Okay. Okay. So you're testing this growth cycle of greens so that you can make adjustments for the next growth cycle. Exactly. Okay. All right. That makes sense. All right. So let's say you do have like a highly diversified uh, small farm, which may be an acre and you're growing 40 different varieties of vegetables. Are there any particular crops that seem to be kind of like an indicator crop that you would want to test those more than some of the other ones? Or do you equally test all? Um, <laughs> oh my goodness. I get asked this question so many times. Um, and I, I've actually I've been thinking a lot about this question in the last few weeks because okay. there are multiple right there are multiple right answers, mm -hmm. um, and it depends on the context and your aspirations and goals. So okay. <clears throat> first, first, first of all, to answer your question directly, there are no indicator species that can be used as a reliable indicator across the board. Uh, yes. Peppers and tomatoes are both solanaceous plants, but their nutritional requirements are on complete polar opposite ends of the spectrum, for example. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, so I've been thinking about trying to develop an illustration or some way to describe context for uh. how do you choose to do sap analysis? How do you choose your irrigation management intensity and all kinds of cultural management uh, decisions. So we kind have of, growers that we work with. Um, so kind of like a decision tree? Kind of like a decision tree. Um, 
So what I've, what I've arrived at so far, the diagram that I've developed at this point is a box with four quadrants. And on the left hand the vertical axis, you have the kind of the farm farming system, if you will. Yeah. And you have high high intensity at the top and low intensity at the bottom. Yeah. Across the bottom of this chart, um, you have on the left hand side, you have um, easy or growers in this group tend. Uh, so this this the, the across the bottom of the chart, you have uh, grower aspirations or goals. Uh -huh. And on the left side, you have ease of use. Uh, the growers in this category tend to th think of themselves as being very pragmatic or very practical, and they want things to take a minimal amount of time and energy and resources, labor. Uh -huh. Growers on the right side aspire to the ideal. They aspire towards perfection. They want optimal soil health. They want really healthy crops that are performing extraordinarily well. Uh -huh. So you have to identify where on this spectrum you fit and then also your farming system that you are kind of plugged into. So for example, if you are attempting to grow um, tomatoes in Massachusetts, then to some degree, you are almost forced into a high intensity farming system. You need to manage those tomatoes really well if you don't want them to succumb to disease uh -huh. because they're going to be very disease prone. So to, I could elaborate on this a bit more, but kind of the short answer, I suppose, is it depends on your aspirations and what you desire to see. We have growers that grow 40 tomato plants that sap, run a sap analysis every two weeks because they aspire to the ideal and they want to grow the absolute best tomatoes possible. Uh -huh. So you're saying that if you want to have that super high system, that even if you're growing 20 types of crops, you may be testing those 20 types of crops consistently because you're trying to get them to be the 100% of what they could be. That's very possible. Uh -huh. There are we we actually work with growers who do that. But that's not that's not necessarily that, Yeah. It is not necessary to do that in order to be a successful grower. So, uh one more thought that is important to add to this conversation is that biology supersedes chemistry, or maybe a better way of saying is that biology determines the nutrients that plants actually absorb. There's a lot of conversations about the need for soil remineralization and uh, balancing based on a soil analysis, and those are all necessary. I believe they're useful and valuable tools. We do them on the farms that we work with. But the bottom line is that when we accept the reality that healthy plants are actually absorbing microbes and microbial metabolites directly from the soil, then that means farming microbes becomes and, and having large microbial populations is more important and more valuable for the crop than perfect mineral balance. And what we have observed is you can have a soil analysis which is perfect. All the nutrient levels and the ratios are exactly where you want them to be and grow a completely disastrous crop, have a complete crop failure in the absence of good biology. But uh -huh. on the other hand, when you have exceptionally good biology, you can grow an amazing crop even when the mineral balance is not optimal. Okay. So another way of saying this is if you chose, if, if you are not that um, if you don't want to do a sap analysis on a small scale on 20 different crops every two weeks through the growing season, the way to ensure that your crops are optimally nutritionally balanced across the board for a lot of different, across a lot of different species is to make sure that you have abundant biology because biology delivers homeostasis. It allows each crop, each plant to balance itself wherever it desires to be. Uh -huh. So it's all about the biology then. Biology is king. Okay, so to that point then, talk to me about people that are doing the hydroponic thing. They don't have, they will never have the same biology as a soil grown system. And they will never achieve the same flavor and aroma profiles as a soil grown system as a result. Uh -huh. 
So last week we had in the podcast, we had Glenn of Alder Spring Ranch, and they produce um, what people say is the tastiest cut of beef because they're ranching in the mountains of Idaho, and the cattle have access to over 500 species in a pristine mountain environment. So once I got thinking about that, I was like, is it even possible for someone, let's say in the Midwest, prairie, prairie grown, to ever achieve that nutrient and taste profile? Uh, it depends on how you define prairie grown. If prairie grown is referring to uh, native prairies or re even I would even suggest reestablished prairies with mm -hmm. 50 to 80 species, that's certainly a far cry from 500 species. But yeah. I would suggest that it is still that is still enough to give us a very distinctive flavor profile. And from a taste and experience perspective, it is likely it's I wouldn't expect it to be significantly different. Mm -hmm. from what you just described. But of course, that's a hypothetical. I haven't actually experienced it, so I don't really know. Yeah. So are there people in the Midwest doing pasture-based that are trying to get that wide, wide variety, like 80 species of, of uh, crops in there for the animals? There are some, not nearly enough. Um, yeah. we, we have entirely too much commodity cropping in this country, and we need to return to a pastoral landscape where we have more livestock grazing. So uh, there certainly is more and more of that happening, but we need a lot more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's ask a, a few questions here, because this is something I get asked you know, from somebody that has, let's say, 8,000 acres of cropland, and they want to think about this, but they don't know where to start. What is the first step for them? In our experience, these are the types of growers that we largely work with. And mm -hmm. um, the, the first step is to grow really healthy crop plants. Whatever you are growing for a crop, have that crop be extremely healthy and photosynthesize very well. You can actually build organic matter and build microbial communities simply by having really healthy plants. And mm -hmm. this is based on a, a few foundational ideas. Um, we, there has been this conversation, particularly in the context of organic and biological agriculture, that it takes a healthy soil to grow a healthy plant. And while that is not incorrect, it most certainly is incomplete. And mm. it's incomplete in that it misidentifies the engine of what creates a healthy ecosystem in the first place. So the question that we should be asking is, all right, well, then what creates a healthy soil? Mm -hmm. And the answer is really healthy plants. Without the contribution of plants, soil is nothing more than decomposed rock particles. Mm -hmm. It is really plants that sequester carbon and build organic matter and build microbial communities. And we can do that with our crop plants as well. When you go back into the historical agronomy or agronomic literature, the, in, during the 60s and 70s, the knowledge of the day was if you want to build organic matter quickly, you grow corn. Today, we have the idea that if you want to deplete organic matter quickly, you grow corn. The only difference is in how they manage that crop then versus the ways that we manage it now, or I should, perhaps I should say the ways that we mismanage it now. Mm -hmm. So it's possible to manage our existing crops to sequester carbon and build organic matter and improve soil health while we are growing a crop. And the pathway to achieving that is to focus on increasing photosynthesis and to establish good microbial populations. So the tools that we use uh, when we're starting on these large farms is we use microbial inoculants, uh, either okay. at seed treatments or at planting. Yeah. And then we, we use foliar applications, one or two or three or five, or however makes sense, uh, however many makes sense in a growing season, to spike that plant's photosynthetic efficiency and increase the quantity of sugars produced. So this is actually, this is a very important piece that I uh, didn't provide the foundation for very well. The foundational idea is most of us don't even know what a healthy plant actually looks like anymore. Mm -hmm. That's the true. Crops that we have come to, the crops that we have come to accept as being common or normal are photosynthesizing somewhere in the neighborhood of about 15 to 20% of their inherent photosynthetic capacity. That's a very small number. Yeah. And they're unlikely to ever be at 100% because they're outdoors in the outdoor environment with diffused carbon dioxide and everything else. This would 100% uh -huh. photosynthetic efficiency would be the type of environment that cannabis growers would be striving for, uh -huh. where they're controlling lighting and humidity and carbon dioxide and all these variables. 
but we can, in an outdoor environment, grow from 20% up to, let's say, 60% for the sake of discussion. So that means you triple the quantity of sugars produced in every day, every 24-hour photo period. But when that happens, you're not particularly going to get triple the plant biomass or triple the yield. So where does all the additional sugar go? Mm. The answer is the, all the additional sugar goes out through the root systems as root exudates to feed soil biology. And when you do the math, you cannot economically afford to buy enough compost or enough molasses or enough humic substances to add the equivalent amount of carbon that a photosynthesizing crop can produce. A healthy corn crop can transmit 15,000 pounds of carbohydrates per acre out through the root system as root exudates. And an unhealthy corn crop does some in the neighborhood of about two to 3,000. Wow. Orders of magnitude difference. So the, this is why I'm such an advocate of foliar applications is because mm -hmm. they, can, they can spoon feed the small amount of nutrients that plants need to dramatically increase their photosynthesis. And I see foliar applications as a way to feed bio, soil biology. They're a way to increase soil microbial populations because of the effect that they have on plants. So I would suggest that for large scale growers, that is the starting point. And then the next uh -huh. step immediately after is to keep that engine going without pause. Keep the soil covered with green plants that are photosynthesizing and have living roots in the soil 365 days out of the year. Anytime you have bare soil, uh, yeah. you are losing your capacity to build organic matter to build biology. Okay. That is a very simple way, but it makes so much sense um, because that living, that living zone over the soil at all times keeps pushing things back down into the soil, the root system. Exactly. Yeah. So a lot of talk about a small scale because I work with a lot of small scale growers that say half acre to an acre. Do you say the exact same thing or are there are other things if they have, if budget is not, an, uh, is not a, a limiting factor for them? If budget is not a limiting factor, um, I would start with the exact same foundation that I just described. And, yep. But now you have the luxury that you can also, you can speed up the system by importing additional materials. So now you can import compost and you can import, you can buy mulch, you can buy compost, you can um, purchase amendments that you couldn't use on a large scale. So that's certainly the place where you can speed up the cycle and, and get huge results immediately in the first year. Uh -huh. Okay, that makes sense. Let's talk about some of the current trends we're seeing right now happening in agriculture. No-till. Um, on large scale, we see that it's been hugely successful. On smaller scale, what are your thoughts on that? Um, <laughs> I find that conversations around tillage are, in many cases, not a conversation where logic is asked to prevail, but they're very emotional conversations. <laughs> it's a very emotional topic for a lot of growers. Okay. Um, and I've observed, I now have 15 years of experience doing consulting work, and I'm often reminded of a quote from one of my mentors, Gary Zimmer. He said, he used to say that there is no rule of biological farming that has not been successfully broken by someone somewhere. Okay. And so what I've observed and experienced, we, we know we don't have, uh, I haven't observed enough no-till fruit and vegetable production in person. Um, okay. There isn't very much on a commercial scale. I would desire for there to be more. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe that we do need to identify and develop better no-till systems. I'm a, in general, my general perspective is that uh, less tillage and less disturbance is usually better. And if we mm -hmm. can do none, that will be ideal for many crops. But then there are also some crops for which it's unavoidable. I have yet to identify someone who can figure out a way to grow carrots or potatoes on a large scale without doing some tillage. Uh -huh. Absolutely. So that to me is surprising that you actually say, you know what, this is great, but we haven't quite seen it work as well as, as best we can. So because, so my mentors were Paul and Sandy Arnold in upstate New York. Um, I think they've been to at least one of your presentations. Um, they introduced me to Dan Kittrich. So that was how I found out about Dan. Um, but they've been farming on the same five acres for 30 years now. 
And yes, they are doing like, you know, cereal grain crops for, for um, cover crops and letting them grow out and then mowing them down. But they are still getting incredible yields after 30 years of cultivation and tillage on that ground. So that's where, you know, with these people that come in that say, you know, oh yeah, all tillage is completely awful. You can't do it. I'm looking at their farm, which is still wildly profitable and organic and pointing out that is, you know, is another possibility. There are dozens of examples like the one that you just described. There's Anna and Eric Nordell in mm -hmm. Central Pennsylvania. Um, and kind of the list goes on and on of very successful farmers who, who have tilled their soils and um the, the question that i understood you to be asking is what is the ideal that we should ultimately strive for i do believe the ideal is to try to limit disturbance mm -hmm. as much as possible but that doesn't mean that we can't have really great ecosystems that do have some tillage because obviously we have plenty of evidence for that to be the case mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that in in the world we live in today one of the very important pieces we need to figure out, uh, particularly on the larger scale, is how to develop climate resilient agriculture. And that to me means we need soils and growing systems that have the capacity to handle nine inches of rain in 24 hours. And they also need to have the capacity to handle no rain for six weeks. Yeah. And it's that first part, handling nine inches of rain in 24 hours where much of present commercial fruit and vegetable production that is using plastic mulch falls short. Mm -hmm. Those soils and those field operations don't have that capacity, yeah. um, at least not that I have observed. So, and then there's also, um, I just this morning, I started, I just received my copy of uh, Brian O'Hara's No-Till no Intensive Vegetable Culture. I, mm -hmm. There's very... There's a very short list of books that I pick up and start reading and go, wow, I love this. And that made the list. Yeah. Um, so definitely it's obvious that no-till vegetable production is successful and can be implemented on a smaller scale. Now I would want to figure out how to do what Brian has done on five acres on a 500 acre or a 5,000 acre grower. Yeah. That's, that's the piece we haven't figured out yet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the next thing is a lot of people are moving to protected culture. Um, so we're seeing more and more greenhouses, even multi-bays, entire farms undercover. What are your thoughts on salt accumulation in those structures? Um, keep the salt out. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, the, the question you have to ask is, where's the salt coming from? Um, it's either coming from irrigation water, which can yeah. be filtered or it's coming from manure and compost applications or fertilizer applications. Um, the only reason, I mean, here's the, here's the simple reality. If you're in a closed structure, then you have control of the ecosystem. And if it's becoming imbalanced, so that, that's as a result of decisions and choices that you made. Yeah, so I guess the follow-up question is, are you seeing that problem with people you're working with is high salts from mismanagement in those structures? Um, we don't see that because we actively test water quality and everything else, and we avoid that and we prevent that from happening in the first place. The one place where we do experience this a lot is in California, where uh -huh. um, they have no choice except to irrigate with water that has extremely high levels of salts and bicarbonates in it. Uh -huh. um, so in those types of environments, when, when the levels are so extremely high that it becomes um, bordering and nothing is impossible, but it becomes unrealistic to filter it out, then um, there are ways of remediating it with biology, with microbial inoculants. We have one inoculant that we use a lot called Spectrum DS, uh -huh. which um, is has the capacity to, um, for lack of a better term, lock up the, it does, it both triggers movement downward through the soil profile and it also locks up and sequesters a lot of the excessive salts in the system. Okay, all right, gotcha. Another one is Korean natural farming. So are you seeing that being implemented successfully with using the systems you're doing as well? And also is that scalable? I don't have experience with KNF. Um, many people have 
described it to me and have asked me to look at it. I mm-hmm. haven't yet given it the deep dive that it deserves. I do believe that in the future, as we, if for us to have a legitimate conversation about regenerative and eventually sustainable agriculture, I think sustainable agriculture comes second once you've achieved true regeneration and a much higher plateau of performance, as we described at the beginning of this conversation. Uh-huh. Once you have a, you're at the point where you desire to sustain the ecosystem, then that should mean that we are not constantly importing inputs from outside the farm. And so we should not constantly be importing amendments and fertilizers and nutrients and foliar sprays, et cetera. I think KNF is one possible pathway of achieving those results. However, um, we work with thousands of growers, um, usually larger scale, but also a number of small scale growers as well. And uh, even medium scale, five, 10 acre growers um, and larger, we haven't yet worked with a single grower who has adopted these principles and put them to work on a larger scale. And I suspect a significant reason for that is not, not because it's ineffective or doesn't work, because I, I don't have the experience to be qual- have a qualified opinion about that, but simply because of the, time, the perceived time commitment. Uh. Many growers already have too much on their plate, and the idea of doing more um, and developing these materials on their own farm is more than many of them want to bite off and chew. Okay, that makes sense. Let's talk about some of the questions that, because when I got ready to do this this podcast, I reached out to our audience. It's like, all right, I'm interviewing John. I'm super excited. <laughs> do you have any questions to ask him? So um, these are some of the questions that they kicked at me that I actually was like, hmm, this is something I'm actually interested in as well. Um, Let's talk about short-term, long-term soil feeding. How do you balance that need to jumpstart right away, but then keep those fire burning? Earlier, when I was speaking about photosynthesis, um, the way that I think about jumpstarting soil regeneration is exclusively about harnessing the energy of plants. Uh-huh. Um, and in, in a small-scale uh, with a high resource environment, you can add compost and do things like that, which are valuable and beneficial. But on a larger scale, I think it is really all about jump-starting photosynthesis. I, I see, from my perspective, foliar applications of nutrients that are properly designed are like starter fluid. They okay. they yep. really kickstart a cold engine and get it running very quickly. They're not something that... Um, they're not a tool that I would expect regenerative farms in depending on the grower's context and goals to be a tool that is used in perpetuity into the future. Mm. But in the early years of regeneration, they're a powerful tool to really accelerate the overall system. Uh huh. Uh huh. So some things like the molasses and stuff, that's something you use a couple times, but after your soil starts to really take off, that's not necessary any longer. It should, not, it, it should not be necessary no longer. And then in terms of the latter part of your question, how do you keep the fires burning? How do you, how do you keep it going for the long term? That's really a function of having a green growing plant every growing day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because the reality is that when we study the science and the intricate details of how soil and plant ecosystems work and function together, we can make it sound incredibly complicated, but in reality, it's extremely simple because it was designed to function. It was designed to work. Uh And if we simply seek to emulate and mimic natural ecosystems, then it will work. We have to just simply get out of the way. And when you look at natural ecosystems, um, keep the soil bare. Does mother nature leave it bare? Absolutely not. She'll cover it with weeds and with plants instantly. Every square inch is used to harvest sunlight and for photosynthesis. Mm. So then let's talk about the larger scale growers you're using. Are they then, let's say, planting a cash crop of, let's say, cabbages and then coming in and putting a cover crop beneath that? Um, operations vary significantly, but the, that would be what I would desire to see, would be to uh-huh. see a cover crop, what we refer to as relay cropping, where we have ah, okay. a cover crop that is planted and um, it's 
mostly shaded out by the cabbage. It doesn't really thrive. It's present, but not really growing mm -hmm. until the cabbage or the kale or whatever gets harvested and boom, away it goes. Mm. Okay. All right. How often do you recommend farmers do soil tests? For our higher value crop growers, fruit and vegetable growers, we do once a year. And okay. for broad acre crops that are more value, we typically do once every three years. Once every three years. And then sap analysis, you're doing that every two weeks during the growing season. For most of our, um, a couple different categories. For our high value fruit and vegetable crops, we're doing every two weeks, every 14 days of the growing season. For a yep. rapid growing crop like a spinach crop, we'll do it every seven days. Okay. And then for our broad acre crop growers who, um, I always advise the larger scale growers to pick at least a few fields and do an analysis every two weeks through the growing season. And not so much largely for the educational experience and to observe how nutrients are trending. Because all of a sudden you realize that the potassium fertilizer that you added or the calcium fertilizer that you added is releasing in the wrong time window. It's releasing 60 days too early or 30 days too late. Yeah. And you can, you can shift the position of when you apply fertilizers for the following year. So it's incredibly valuable from that perspective. But um, generally, our larger scale broad acre growers will uh, pick a few representative fields and pull three to five samples uh, over the course of a growing season. And mm -hmm. usually, uh, they will target those to be two weeks or so before they expect to make an application so that we can customize that application. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about pH a bit. I know something that we see some growers struggle with is the a high pH. What is the best way you found to push that down? Are you doing that through like biology or actually adding amendments? Um, so you asked the question of what is the best way? Um, Depends a bit on perspectives, I suppose, and ideals and goals. But here, here's a there's several different ways. Okay. I would say that from a bio, biological perspective, um, and depending on the degree of alkalinity load, if you have a soil that has a high degree of uh, high accumulation of bicarbonates or uh, alkali elements, this may not be enough. But in general, the best way is to grow plants with acidic root systems, uh, cover crops, for example. So um, oats are known to have a very acidic root system, as is buckwheat. Okay. Um, several different legumes have very acidic root systems. So if you can grow cover crops with acidic root systems, it's actually surprising. Uh, I think buckwheat root systems have a pH in the neighborhood of about 4.5. Okay. And a few successive cover crops of buckwheat can have a significant impact on lowering soil pH here on the East Coast. On the West Coast, where you have high levels of bicarbonate and lower uh -huh. rainfall, uh, cover crops are not prob probably not going to be enough. So additional tools that you could use would be um, adding nitrogen fertilizer on commercial operations. Yep. And this is well known, but what many people miss is that there's actually an analog in organic operations. We observe over and over again, uh, particularly here in the east where we have higher rainfall, is that when organic growers start adding a lot of manure, say dairy manure, or even composted manure, all of a sudden they get a pH drop because of the presence of nitrogen in that manure. So uh -huh. um, that can also have an acidifying effect. And then the obvious mineral acidifiers that people might be familiar with would be gypsum or elemental sulfur applications. Uh -huh. we, we use both of these uh, a lot um, further west and also occasionally here in the east when we have limestone-based soils, cal calcareous soils. So both of those are valuable tools. Uh -huh. Okay, so the one thing I'm not hearing you say is injecting like a citric acid. Um, no, because the quantities of citric acid or acetic acid that would need to be injected to actually make a difference are usually cost prohibitive. Mm, okay, that makes sense. So what about high magnesium? Because I've seen that happen as well. Yeah, high magnesium is a fun one. It's very common here in the Northeast um, and in many other parts of the country as well. Um, our tool for high magnesium is usually a gypsum application, occasionally elemental sulfur. Okay. Uh, we have also have particularly high calcium levels, but generally a gypsum application, calcium sulfate. And um, 
and application rates, you can safely go up to 3,000 pounds per acre per year. Uh, okay. Actually, you can do more than that, but you, you have to be careful how close you come to the crop. You might want need to be 60, 90 days or more before planting the crop. Okay. But um, gypsum is a very interesting material in that um, it solubilizes the magnesium. It moves the magnesium down to the profile and replaces it with calcium to a limited degree. Um, it actually, gypsum, you shouldn't consider gypsum applications as uh, replacing magnesium with calcium and what we have observed. It generally tends to actually acidify the soil um, and the calcium that is present in gypsum doesn't attach strongly to the so soil colloid. Okay, so then you may also have to use a calcium source. Um, after a year or two or three of gypsum applications, um, obviously you would be retesting and reanalyzing, mm -hmm. but it's entirely plausible. Let's say you have a soil that is 55% base saturation calcium and 30% uh -huh. magnesium, which is not all that uncommon. Uh -huh. um, with several years of successive gypsum applications, it's fairly common to see the magnesium levels drop from 30% down to, let's say, 18% or 17% base saturation. Uh -huh. But the calcium percentage has only moved from 55% up to 60%. Uh -huh. um, so it's moved a little bit, but yeah. it's not increased as much as you would like. And that's the place where limestone fits, calcium carbonate. Okay, makes sense. Let's talk about compost. Now, at the beginning of the conversation, you mentioned a couple different types of compost that you'll use for different applications. Do you have a preferred way that you like to apply the compost or um, different types of compost? I've had the privilege of observing compost from many different operations and different ways of production. Um, I'm very impressed with the um, humus composting technology developed by Midwest Biosystems, which is uh -huh. generally appropriate only for larger scale operations. But I have recently, and we've used, many of our growers use much of a lot of the uh, humus compost, but recently I've been incredibly, incredibly impressed with the field performance of the Johnson Sioux bioreactor compost. Okay. Um, we've actually, uh, a colleague that I worked with in uh, Europe collected compost samples from all over Europe using different types of composting methodologies and analyzed them in the laboratory, uh, multiple different laboratories, different analytical procedures, applied them to the soil as compost tea, as well as compost, and then measured the soil response. And the piece that I found really intriguing, his, his research is private, it's not been published. I don't know if it will be or not, but I did get to, to review the data. And Many uh, in the laboratory, the Johnson Sioux compost didn't look, didn't appear significantly different from other sources of compost in terms of the biological profile mm. that was present. There were a few uh, exceptions, I think particularly the beneficial nematodes were an order of magnitude higher. But aside mm -hmm. from that, the profile looked relatively similar. But when you applied it to the soil, the Johnson Sioux outperformed everything else in terms of increasing the microbial population by a factor of 10x or more. Mm. So I've heard similar stories, uh, and I actually have two bioreactors that I built a year ago that I've been uh, playing with and experimenting with. I'm very impressed with what I see so far. So just early days of gaining experience with that, but um, the early experience is that the Johnson Sioux compost seems to be quite exceptional. And what I'm really intrigued by, so often we've worked with a lot of growers over the years who've used compost teas, uh, both extracts, compost tea extracts, and brood. And the challenge that I've observed has been a challenge of consistency and reliability. They mm. work really, really well about 30 or 40 percent of the time, and the rest of the time they don't work so well because of the quality of the compost or the way it was extracted. I, there's obviously a lot of variables at play. So I'm, a favor of, I'm in favor of using compost. Um, we also use a lot of manufactured inoculants that were uh -huh. developed by Tineo Technology because of the reliability and consistency, and there's organisms that seem to be completely missing from our soil profiles today. But 
a manufactured inoculant with 30 ingredients or 30 species or 10 species or 50 species doesn't begin to match the complexity that's in the soil profile. And so I think for those reasons, it is valuable to use compost and compost teas only when, this is actually a qualifier that I'd like to add, we should only begin thinking about applying compost and compost teas once we have first successfully figured out cover crops and keeping our co soils constantly covered. Because mm. if we have soils that are not, basically, you can add all the microbes you want, but unless you give them a food source, you should not expect them to thrive. Mm. We need a constant food source. We need root exudates every single day, every 24 hours. And if we don't have that, then um, compost teas, I wouldn't suggest they're ineffective or worthless, but they will be significantly less effective. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So you mentioned compost teas versus compost. Talk to us about why you would use a compost tea versus a compost. Is that maybe a cost analysis? Um, cost and application ability. Mm -hmm. So if you're dealing with 8,000 acres, then you can't find or afford to purchase enough compost to apply compost in that scale, but you can apply 10 gallons of compost tea per mm -hmm. acre fairly easily. And when do you like to apply the compost tea? Um, early and often. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and on the larger scale operations, those are the, I think the most important application at any time is at planting. Okay. Um, if you're planting annual crops and then perennial crops, fall, spring applications. Um, and in our recommendations, when we work uh, growers that we work with, we use our purchase inoculants instead of compost teas because many of them, majority of them don't have access to good compost tea. Uh -huh. And we do those, um, we use microbial inoculants at a, a seed treatment, which I think is the single most important application that a grower can do, the most valuable, the biggest ROI. Uh -huh. And um, then in addition to being a seed treatment, depending on the crop, we also do an infero application at planting. Uh -huh. And then a fall and spring, just general soil broadcast. Those are uh -huh. the four applications that the great majority of our growers use all four. And then there are also the vegetable growers and fruit growers will frequently um, add microbial inoculants in the course of the growing season in the irrigation system, maybe two or four times or six or eight times, depending on what crop we're talking about through the course of the growing season. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm assuming that when you apply these, you don't want to be applying right before it's going to be hot and sunny out. You want to try to give them a chance to work down with like a, a rainy or a night application or something like that. Yes. And if you're able to irrigate, um, irrigate them in mm -hmm. and, or even apply them to the irrigation system. Um, yeah, you have, to, you have to get them down into contact with the soil and keep them protected from ultraviolet radiation, obviously. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What are the questions that farmers should be asking that you frequently see them not asking? I would say the questions that farmers should be asking or the things they should be thinking about that they frequently don't is to really be conscious of the choices that you make on your farms and your management intensity, your aspirations. Uh -huh. And the one framework that I've really found useful is the holistic management framework. So uh -huh. holistic management is often used to, in the context of livestock management or grazing management, but reality, in reality, holistic management is a great framework for thinking about any farming operation. And so many times I have conversations with growers who find themselves trapped, stuck, doing things they don't enjoy doing mm. and losing their passion for farming as a result of decisions that they may not even have consciously made, but they just accepted the status quo and moved forward with it. So mm. I think asking the question about uh, and, and being conscious that you do have a choice and you can farm differently and uh, use different types of systems. And an example of this perhaps would be um, farmers that maybe they in inherit an orchard that has lots of problems or has the wrong rootstock. Um, and there's, there's a quote or a, a line that I picked up somewhere that 
you should never do you should never permit yourself to be constantly engaged in work that makes you dislike farming or that makes you dislike what you are doing. Obviously, mm-hmm. all of us have jobs occasionally that are unpleasant and that mm-hmm. we want to get through as quickly as possible and get on to the next thing. That's just a reality and a fact of life. But that should be the minority. When we find ourselves disliking much of what we're doing, mm-hmm. I think we need to reevaluate why we're doing what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. there'll always be those bad days. But if every day is a bad day, then that's a sign. That's a sign that you're in the wrong space or doing the wrong thing. Mm-hmm. With that, I'd like to stop here and take a quick break. In a minute, we'll be back with John from Advancing Eco Agriculture. If you've been enjoying this episode so far, you're going to want to head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download our free resource bundle to help you shave hours off your week and become a thriving farmer. It includes resources such as our 10 winter growing secrets we wish we knew when we started, which is a ebook which talks about the tips and techniques to get better growth in your winter production. We teach things like the simple but counterintuitive principle that trips up most beginning growers, the shape and size of tunnels that are best for winter production, how to prepare beds so they are weed free and get beautiful lush stands of crops, what to do about pests like aphids, voles, and slugs, how to fast track your research to fine tune your production for your microclimate, and how to pack in more crops for higher yields and profits. So head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download your free resource bundle today. So talk to me about your mentors. You mentioned earlier Gary Zimmer. Who else were helped you, you know, guide you along the way as you were building your knowledge base? Oh, I owe a big a large credit of thanks to many mentors. I've had I've had many incredible mentors both in person and then also uh, I think it's worth giving credit to the mentors who I've only met through their written words and not have never uh-huh. met in person. There's a long list of those as well. So for those who I've met in person and spent uh, time with over the last 15 years, there was Gary Zimmer and Jerry Bernetti, uh-huh. uh, Bruce Tinio, who's now passed on, um, Don Huber and Michael McNeil, Jerry Hatfield, uh, Bob Kramer. Uh-huh. Uh, there's a fairly long list of people who have done a lot of fascinating work in the area of plant pathology and plant immunity, disease and insect resistance, um, and just agronomy in general. So there's there's a lot of mentors that I've had in the space that uh, I'm very grateful for. And, you know, I'm also grateful that uh, people have freely shared their knowledge and their information. And um, the quote is, freely you have received, freely give. Uh-huh. I think that holds true for all of us. Uh-huh. Talk to me about some of the written mentors, because some of those works go way, way back. Yeah. Uh Written mentors, there's Jerry Stoller from Stoller Enterprises, who was absolutely fascinating on uh, on really deeply understanding plant hormones and hormonal interactions. Uh There's Dr. Bill Jackson, William Jackson, who wrote a trilogy of books that are all, I would guess, in the six to 700 page range, uh, absolute doorstoppers. The first one was titled um, Humic or organic soil conditioning, humic, fulvic, and microbial balance. Um, each of his three books is an incredible read. And uh, unfortunately, Bill passed away very recently as well. Um, Dr. May Wan Ho, um, in her work on genetics and epigenetics and the biophysics of organisms and the uh-huh. crystalline structure of all these compounds within organisms. Um, she passed away a few years ago as well, never had the privilege of meeting her. So and there's, there's a long list uh, also. Out, there's, there's obviously the pioneers within the agricultural space. Um, uh-huh. One reference that I think is underappreciated and not widely known enough is uh, Bargelia Retaver, if I'm saying that, pronouncing the name correctly. She... she um, Actually, both of the, the pair of them, a uh, husband and wife, wrote a book titled, um, what's the title? The Organic Method Primer. Uh. It is an incredibly valuable book that all organic growers or all biological growers should be reading. And 
it's really fascinating because she collected a lot of the science of the uh, the hidden pieces or the missing pieces. She was talking about plant cells having the capacity to absorb large molecules across the membrane through the process of endocytosis 40 years ago, which has been recognized and established for human cells and for mm. animal cells for 70 some years, but we've never thought about plant nutrition in the context of uh, absorbing macro macromolecules across cell membranes. So she was an incredible pioneer and the book is an incredible wealth of knowledge. It is an encyclopedia of, mm. of cultural management practices that can uh, help us improve our crops and soils performance. And there's, there's a long list. And, and I get asked the question a lot about uh, my recommended reading list. I, I got asked it so often that I actually wrote a blog post about it. Awesome. Uh, that's published on my blog. Let's just do a search for John's recommended reading list. And a lot of my favorite authors and books are there. Awesome. So let's talk about your work with farmers. If there was, let's say, a magic reset button for these farmers you work with, what would you like to see them go back and put into place sooner rather than later? I believe the world that we live in today, we need to figure out water management and climate resilience sooner rather than later. Mm. Um, in, the last, in the last five to seven years, I have seen entirely too many farms that were doing many things well and they were managing well, experienced severe setbacks and severe losses as a result of not having good water management and not being able to manage nine inches of rainfall in 24 hours. And I've used that uh, as a uh -huh. talking point before in this conversation. Uh, I think as crazy as it sounds, well, first of all, there's this idea that we can build soil organic matter and soil porosity and have very rapid water infiltration such that we can infiltrate three inches or four inches or perhaps even nine inches of rain in an hour. And we can, and that is awesome. And the idea that flows often follows from that is that we can build organic matter high enough that we have such a tremendous water holding capacity that we don't need to worry about drainage with drain tile or something like that. I am not a believer that that is the case. Um, I've observed, and in fact, there's been a number of conversations I've had just in the last year where growers have said, my soils are now so high in organic matter. We have such good water infiltration and, and porosity that I'm rebuilding and regenerating a lot of springs on my farm. I had a conversation with one grower who developed 37 springs on a quarter section of 160 acres that have been flowing continuously now for the last two and a half years. Oh, wow. That's really incredible. That's really incredible. But he has a problem. And his problem is his soil is constantly saturated to the point mm -hmm. where it's very difficult to farm. And so I believe in, in some of these, and it's saturated not because of mismanagement on his part, but as a result of the fact that for the last two years, they've had over 60 inches of rainfall each year. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that, again, this is all based on context and soil mm -hmm. conditions and landscapes and all that. But in general, I believe that in the future, we will need to have better capacity for drainage. We need to be able to move surface water off without erosion. Yep. We need to be able to move subsurface water off and in, depending on the crops and the ecosystems, we may also need to have an increased capacity to irrigate. Mm -hmm. So you need to be able to store water as well with either um, developing ponds or just wetlands and that sort of thing. Yep. Yep. So yep, exactly. I believe the ideal would be to have your subsurface drainage go into storage into a pond and then have the capacity to irrigate from that when needed. Mm -hmm. So something you said there about organic matter, do you believe that there's such a thing as too much organic matter? Uh, no, I don't believe that. I've never okay. encountered it. And there was actually some fascinating research. Um, Raoul Francais, I think from France, did some research back in the 40s and 50s, and they found the most incredible soils 
with some really amazing plant performance results were at 70% organic matter, 7-0. And they were not muck soils. They originated as mineral soils, but they built so much organic matter over uh, a few decades that they were up to 70% organic matter. Wow. So is there a, <laughs> yeah, that's almost, that's hard to believe. I can't imagine yeah. the, the friability of that. Um, so when you're working on soils, is there a level that you shoot for, or you're always just shooting to go higher and higher? We are never satisfied. We're always seeking for more. Now, with that being said, you certainly do reach a plateau where, uh, I shouldn't say a plateau, but you do reach a point where the entire system begins functioning extraordinarily extraordinarily well all on its own. You don't need mm -hmm. to be constantly adding inputs and it just, you've gotten the flywheel rolling and now the flywheel takes off on its own. You've built a lot of momentum. Mm -hmm. um, and in those systems, if you truly have momentum and the momentum keeps going, then you should constantly build organic matter higher and higher. We have growers who are now approaching nine, 10, 11, a few even as high as 13%. And um, they don't need to be constantly applying inputs to keep that level constantly increasing. They just need green growing plants all the time. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. So I actually, the first time I heard you speak live was at an Acres USA presentation. And you actually weren't necessarily, you were talking a little bit about the soil health aspect and nutrition, but you were more talking about like, I think it was rules for like profitable farming or something. And in it, you were talking, one of them was about risk management, the reactive versus predictive versus proactive. Expand on that a little bit for us, because that is something that I actually now make sure that I talk to my growers about constantly. Well, the concept originally came from lean manufacturing. It was um, and we, I arrived at this as a result of uh, in the early years of our consulting work at Advancing Eco Agriculture. We would sit down every year at the end of the growing season and evaluate the success and level of performance that our growers were experiencing from mm -hmm. our perspective, our assessment, not the growers' perspective, because we quickly discovered that um, there was a group of growers who, no matter how incredible the results, they were never quite satisfied. And then also a group of growers who were quite satisfied, uh, even with uh, results where they still had a lot of opportunity left on the table. And so we would rank the success of all of our growers and group them together, uh, group the ones and twos together, group the nines and tens together, and then evaluate what are the similarities and what are the differences within each of these groups and between the two groups. And we learned a lot about agronomy and plant nutrition doing this exercise. We, re we repeated it year after year after year. Uh -huh. But over a few years, uh, we quickly were able to identify the agronomy challenges and worked to address those. So what occurred was that, or what we started observing was the differences that were showing up were really in management. And so I've actually, we put a webinar together on this, I think also a podcast episode that people can find if they want to. Uh -huh. um, what, would, what would they search for? Um, I think the title for the webinar is Management Practices of Exceptionally Successful Farm Managers. Okay. And, and if I, I will find that, I'll put it in the show notes as well. So people can just go to the thrivingfarmerpodcast.com and we'll link to all of everything we've talked about here. What, one of the characteristics that we observed that you asked about was the response time or the anticipation of problems uh -huh. uh, or potential challenges where uh, it was a concept that came from lean manufacturing where they spoke about and think about reactive managers. So reactive managers respond after a problem is present. So respond to, let's say, Japanese beetles or cucumber beetles or the presence of a disease after they are present. Yeah. And proactive, proactive managers respond when they anticipate a problem based on history and other indicators, perhaps climactic indicators. Uh, they might put on the preventative foliar spray or preventative fungicide application uh -huh. for commercial growers. But then there was kind of the ultimate or the predictive managers. They sought to predict, they, they sought to develop the data that would predict a disease or an insect problem or some type of problem showing up at some point in the future. And they sought to identify the root causes of those problems uh -huh. and remove those root causes of the problems before the problem ever showed up. So 
those were kind of three different levels of management and the most successful growers. There's a direct correlation between the growers who seek to be predictive mm. and who are the most profitable and the most successful. Absolutely. So, and the Japanese beetle, you know, some of these newer farmers, they just go out and see Japanese beetles and like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do. And they try to figure something out, but by then it's too late. I mean, the crop is probably already ruined. Exactly. And the highest level is, oh my gosh, we've had Japanese beetles in the past. They usually show up around this time because of these characteristics. How are we as a farm, how are we making sure that those characteristics never happen in our field so they won't show up? Exactly. How, how have you been speaking about it to your growers? I, pretty much the same thing, but usually more in like an aspect of, so we talk a lot about cold hardiness. And obviously we talk about the sugar levels, but we also talk about the level of hardening off a plant. And so we talk about actually where you can predict, you know, that this cold front is coming. So you actually start hardening off the plant beforehand by, let's say, opening your, your sides and by... Um, making sure the, the you cool that crop down and stress it a little bit with some water, reducing the water and that sort of thing. So those are some of the things we talk about in how you do this, because if you're not managing this, um, if you're not doing it right, then you will go out there and your plants are all dead. Whereas if you had managed yeah. correctly um, and, you know, we also talk a little bit about, you know, adding some micronutrients and stuff. If you do that right before freeze too, that can also help the hardiness, but that's kind of the biggest area we talk about it. But again, it all, it, it's so many aspects of your farm where it plays a, a, a point in too. I mean, to also talk yeah. about irrigation side. I mean, you just mentioned having that irrigation capacity. Um, on our farm, we got to the point we would not open a field unless we said, okay, we're drawing our irrigation from here because that's such an important aspect of, well, and especially vegetable production. Exactly. Yeah, so, I like that. Yeah. So you've built a pretty big team now at your company and hiring good people is always something that farmers talk about struggling with. What kind of strategies have you implemented to bring the right kind of people on? It's, I believe it is of foundational importance to hire people who believe what you believe and who care about what you care about. Mm. If you hire people who are working for you for the money, then they, there will always be challenges of not being committed, not working until the job is done, mm -hmm. uh, not following through. But if you work with a team, when you work with people who believe what you believe and who care about the things you care about, then all of us together as a team contribute our blood, sweat, and tears to do the job that needs to be done. And um, in agriculture, we all know that this is not a 40-hour work week <laughs> yes. um, at, at, any, at any time of the year. Um, as, as, and there are times of the year for us as a team, uh, we've, we've joked that we have our 40 hours in by Wednesday lunchtime, um, <laughs> certain yes. parts of the year. <laughs> and and yeah. So it is that level of commitment. That level of commitment only occurs when you have passion and uh -huh. when you care. And yes, uh -huh. people need to be paid well. People need to be compensated for the uh, results that they're producing and uh, the work that they're contributing. That is, that, that is foundational. But I really believe the most important thing, of the most important part of building a team that works together extremely well as a team um, and is able to bring an organization or a farm or a company to the next level mm. is people who are all passionate and have the same ideal and the same vision. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So do you have people coming to you now that just want to work for you and say you might not even be hiring? <laughs> we, uh, we received an awesome email a while ago from someone who, uh, suggested they would be willing to eat dirt to come work for us. <laughs> <laughs> they, they didn't so, know how literal uh, that actually was. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, yes, yeah, I was talking to Elliot Coleman one time, and he was talking about how he does, hasn't sampled soil for the last X number of years. And I think he mentioned to the point of something to the effect of, well, I taste the soil. So I, that's how I sample my soil. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Anyway. <laughs> yeah. No, I think we do have a challenge as a company, though, in that um, the 
the level of agronomy knowledge that is needed to deliver the results and the performance that we've become known for is on a level that is, it's a completely different stratosphere than mainstream agronomy knowledge. And so many times when we hire people and bring people on board, we have a very intense training program that mm. uh, the first ni- the first 90 days are really intense. And then at the, the total training, uh, we don't have a consultant. We don't consider a consultant qualified to make recommendations without immediate oversight um, for the first 18 months in many cases. Wow. And um, we have had a number of people who've gone through that 90-day course who said that I learned more in the first 90 days working for you than I did during my university degree. Uh-huh. And um, so that is that is a constraint for us uh, as we grow as a company, and the one that we're also actively working to remove by uh, trying to transfer as much of this knowledge as possible um, into software tools that can do a lot of the calculations that are necessary, that they can correlate spe- the presence of specific diseases or specific insects with a specific nutritional profile, and uh-huh. that they help farmers move into this predictive management place. So I think it's very important to democratize and digitize information so that it is readily available and equally accessible to the person who has a quarter acre of vegetables and the person who has 10,000 acres of commodity crops in the Midwest. Yeah. Um, so that is something that we're seeking to work for is to, to remove that as a blockage and to digitize and democratize that information. So that allows your, your employees or consultants to actually do more because they don't have to spend time manually calculating. Well, and eventually at some point, um, if the tools become well-developed enough, uh, they will never be a replacement for hearts and minds and eyes on Mm -hmm. the ground and closely connected with the plant. But they do allow um, anyone who cares to learn and be observant and pay attention the capacity to be those hearts and minds and eyes. So it's not just the AEA team. It can be a farmer Mm -hmm. in Africa who can have access to the software platform and make the observations and input the data, describe what is happening and get immediate recommendations. Uh huh. Absolutely. Let's talk about new farmers. What is the biggest mistake that you see beginning farmers making? Um, there are two that I observe frequently. The first, uh, and this happens commonly with farmers who are approaching farming for the first time and don't have an agricultural background, is not being timely with the details. Uh. Farming is made up of a thousand little details, and if you miss weeding by one day and it happens to rain for the next week, you've just gone from a one hour job to a 40 hour job. Mm. Um, And the second is not closely enough analyzing and understanding uh, enterprise economics and crop economics for each different crop. Uh, Far too many cases I see growers, I'm referring specifically in this context to smaller scale growers who Um, grow crops that they may not even be breaking even on and Uh they don't understand that they're not breaking even on them. Uh So I would say ultimately farming as a lifestyle can only be successful if farming as a business is successful. And uh, we have to make certain that our operations are profitable. I have never heard someone say it just like that. And that's something I want to kind of pull back and look at again. As you said, you will never be profitable or successful as farming as a lifestyle unless you start with farming as a business. I mean, as our company exists to help farmers make money, and we basically do that through talking about business and helping that. But I never thought about it that way, how you said, if you want to make the lifestyle, you've got to make the business work first. If the business isn't sustainable, then the lifestyle isn't sustainable either because the business sustains the lifestyle. Uh It's really that simple. It's, I find it really interesting. Um, Different people have very different relationships with money as a result of their Uh. net cumulative life experiences. And as a result of the different relationships that people have with money, some people attract money and manage money very well, and others tend to ignore money for a variety of different reasons. And I'm I'm not one, I'm not offering any judgment. Uh, It's just a reality of what is. 
I would suggest, actually, there is a book that uh, I recommend frequently to friends and colleagues. It's titled The Millionaire Mind by T. Harv Ecker, or Secrets of the Millionaire Mind, T. Harv Ecker. Uh-huh. And actually, I think it's a valuable book, would be a valuable book for all farmers to read. Fairly small, it's maybe 150 pages or something like that. Uh-huh. And um, it describes how people think about money differently. And here's kind of the bottom line. If you have a good relationship with money, you generally will make great farming decisions. If you don't have a good relationship with money, you will make many decisions that may be based on passion rather than on economic reality and may unfortunately end up in a situation where your farm is not sustainable as a business Mm. and thus you lose out on the farm as a lifestyle as well. Uh 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 So what if working with more advanced farmers, what are the simple things that you see them doing that make themselves more profitable? The most important thing that really successful growers embrace is identifying precisely what crop characteristics determine their profitability. So once you've identified the crop, then you say, okay, what are the crop characteristics that produce profitability? And or what maybe a bit different way of saying it is what defines marketable yield? Uh. So marketable yield on one crop uh, for one crop might be storability. Maybe you need to store apples in the cooler for four months yeah. or potatoes. Uh, for another crop, it might be size and firmness. For tomatoes, it might be firmness and non-cracking or not having a green core. So identifying exactly what are the fruit characteristics that determine marketable yield, how much of your produce or crop actually makes it to the market. And then identify, once you've identified what those characteristics are, you identify the cause of failing to produce those characteristics and what you can do about them. And this is something that all the most successful growers that we have worked with refuse to delegate this to anyone else. They will hire accountants and agronomists and crop scouts, but understanding the knowledge of uh, and and the crop physiology of what's happening and what's going on at the stages when these characteristics are being produced and managing that, they obsess over. They refuse to delegate it to a crop scout or an agronomist or to anyone else. They want, they take personal responsibility for developing the crop characteristics that determine profitability and marketable yield. Mm. Interesting. And I'm sure what that means in some cases that there are certain periods of that crop growth that they are like almost in the field 24 seven because they know that that period is so important. Well, in, in concept, yes, they're not necessarily in the fields 24-7, but um, for many, yeah, if, if you take apples as an example, and having apples, many apples need to be stored for multiple months, and it's very common for 50% of the apples on some varieties that go into storage to be thrown away and not uh, never be shipped when they come out of storage because they've spoiled during mm. sto- storage. So you've just had a 50% cut in in the crop that actually made it into the cooler. And that's not counting the crop that dropped off the tree. Uh So you want the crop to stay on the tree and not drop off. And then when it gets to the cooler, you want it to be able to ship after a few months. So we've, it's not uncommon to have apple growers for a few varieties. This is certainly not general true of all rice, but for a few varieties to have as little as 35 to 40% marketable yield of all the fruit that develop on the tree, almost that percentage actually ever gets shipped. It's possible to change that number to the mid to upper 90s simply by managing nutrition well in a four-week window immediately after pollination. Oh, wow. the The growers who understand the cell division, cell expansion switch that happens, uh-huh. Uh, for apples, they they want to know that and they manage that intensely. Uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. Do you think there's anything that new farmers should avoid their first year, or in the beginning years of business? Going back to something we expressed earlier, never do anything that would make you or your partner dislike farming. And the challenge to, to that concept, uh, the the challenge 
that I see many beginning farmers encounter is they reach exhaustion. They bite off more than they can chew. They don't fully anticipate the commitment that might be needed. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I see that too so often. If you could pick one, what would be your favorite farming tool? Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> I think my favorite farming tool is a pair of eyes and a heart in the field. I deliberately said heart and not mind. Uh. Um, the This is, again, something that is was one of the characteristics that was shared amongst all the most successful growers, all of our nines and tens, uh-huh. is they spent time in the field observing their crops and just feeling and connecting. What do their crops need? What do they desire? Um, and how are they doing? So uh, Carrie Reams has made a quote, had a quote, a phrase that he used quite frequently, which was, see what you look at. And seeing what you look at is, Obviously, there's the skill of observation and mm-hmm. being conscious of what it is that you're observing and questioning it, mm-hmm. but also feeling it, um, just intuitively connecting with what's happening, what's going on. All of the most successful growers that we have worked with would routinely make comments. We would be driving in a truck and walk into a field or into a block, and they would start walking through a block of trees, perhaps, and say something like, this block just doesn't feel right. I don't, mm. know, I don't know what's going on. I don't understand it, but this block just doesn't feel right. There was that intuitive gut knowing or heart knowing that wasn't related to anything that they could describe consciously or verbally, but they sensed that something was off. Uh-huh. That, I think, is one of the most powerful and most valuable tools that we can develop. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Interesting. Do you believe that now is the best time to be starting a farm? I think any time is the best time if you if you uh, approach it consciously and you make good choices. Um, uh-huh. Right now, to, to give some context to that statement, um, you can always identify farming sectors and crops where growers are failing and are not doing well. And at that same moment in time, you can find some growers who are doing extremely well. Right now, the dairy industry is in a crisis. We're losing thousands of dairy farms per year, Uh and uh, they haven't made money for a number of years, and it doesn't seem to be any good probability of making money and being so profitable in the near-term future, perhaps ever again, who knows. But at the same moment as this is happening, um, we work with a young farmer in central Pennsylvania who is organically certified. He's 100% grass-fed. He's not receiving a price premium for being 100% grass-fed. Uh, He is receiving an organic premium, and as a young farmer, uh, in dairy terms, considered to be small-scale, farming 70 cows, and he made a net profit of over $200,000 this last year. Wow. Uh, And he's he's, he's 30 years old, and he's paying for his third farm. Wow. He already owns two farms that he's cashed off. So this is in the middle of a dairy crisis. Here's a young farmer who's doing it incredibly well. Yeah. So I think that any time is the best time if you are smart about it. He is smart uh-huh. about it. He's uh-huh. very has a great relationship with money. He's very conscious about what he does and why he does it. And he's being successful when other farmers with 40 years of experience are failing. Uh-huh. 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 Yeah, my former partner that started the company with me and uh, I bought him out a couple of years ago just because he ended up getting financing, but he now has a raw milk dairy in Virginia. And the same thing, you know, obviously he's selling direct to retail, so he has a much, much better price thing, but he was able to leverage himself onto a farm that was incredibly expensive. And he spoke to me on the phone the other day and was like, you know, Michael, we're starting to get to the point where I need to actually start to think about our money because we're starting to make really good money on this and we're starting to figure out how to pay things down and all that. So you're absolutely right is there is that opportunity, um, but you know, hearing the story you just told me of someone who's actually doing what people say is impossible is so good to hear. Yeah. Benjamin Franklin, quote, nothing is good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right, so to wrap up here, what is the one question you wish I had asked, but I didn't so far? 
Oh, come on, Michael. That's the question <laughs> I like to ask other people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me see. One thing that we didn't touch on very much that I am very passionate about is the implications of what this type of nutrition management and farming management mean, means for public health. Mm. Um, we, we know that we have a public health crisis, crisis essentially, in, in, the, in the westernized world and here in North America and in the U.S. in particular. And um, from my assessment, what I can observe is that that crisis, when you try to identify it to the root causes, um, there are kind of three different areas of foundational areas of root causes. There are all the environmental influences, exposure uh -huh. to electromagnetic radiation and exposure to toxins in our atmosphere and our drinking water, um, fluoridation and chlorine and et cetera, et cetera. There's, there's a long list of um, then household chemicals, of course, soaps uh -huh. and cleaners are particularly horrific and air fresheners. There's, there's lots of craziness going on there that people really should be paying attention to. Um, then, so that, that's kind of one area. Then the second significant area is food manufacturing, where we're eating foods that are high in sugars and high in salts and high in the wrong kinds of fats. So we have lots of manufactured foods that are really not good for us. And then I think the third significant contributing area is the quality of the raw materials that goes into food production, uh -huh. uh, where we have today, we have a lot of crops which do not have good nutrition. Essentially, <clears throat> my perspective is that actually this William Albrecht uh, defined this originally. He said that insects and diseases are nature's garbage collectors. They're here to take the unhealthy plants out of the system. So mm. what that basically means is if you have a crop that is being consumed by diseases and being consumed by insects, the message is really quite simple. It's not fit for human consumption. And then, of course, commercial practice, we in our wisdom spray it with toxins and feed it to people. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I do believe that agriculture is a significant contributor to the public health crisis that we have. And it uh -huh. also has the capacity to be a significant solution. We can produce biofortified foods that have strong nutritional integrity, that have functional immune systems, and enhance people's immune systems as well. And really for us as growers, as farmers, um, we talk about regenerating the land and sequestering carbon dioxide and being passionate about feeding people. Um, those are all valuable, necessary for the best connection, for to have a true heartfelt connection. But ultimately, we are also doctors. We can prevent people from becoming ill by providing mm. them with good nutrition. That's something that doctors in a hospital can't do. They can't prevent people from becoming ill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is, I think, why I'm so passionate that farmers actually make white collar incomes because they are so important. If they are looking at it from a regenerative lens and looking to build and grow the most nutrient dense food possible, then they are just as important and as important as the doctors and the medical system. And and I would I would just say yep. much more important. Yeah. And. Going back to a conversation we've circled around a few times, something that you just said, man, uh, white collar incomes, white collar incomes, but uh, also producing those white collar incomes on a reasonable amount of time and time commitment. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We know in agriculture, there, there are seasonal intensities that are mm -hmm. in, in many, for many different crops that are necessary and unavoidable. Uh, we try to spread those out as much as we can, but then there's also seasonal relaxations uh, the young dairy farmer that I mentioned earlier, making greater than 200000 a year in profit, um, I would say on average, he works less than 40 hours a week. Wow. That's amazing. That's incredible. Yeah. I want to be that dairy farmer. <laughs> I know. <Yes. laughs> I mean, you and I are doing this on a Saturday afternoon. I just need to let our audience know. <laughs> So, John, where can people find out more about you and your work? The central organizing place that I've just developed in December of last year is johnkemp.com. Uh, uh -huh. I've been passionate about it 
number of different sharing information in a number of different ways. We obviously have our company, advancingecoag.com, uh, Advancing Eco Agriculture, and then the podcast, Regenerative Agriculture Podcast, which I would love for all of your listeners to check out because uh-huh. not because I'm the host, but because I get to interview some amazing people who say some of the most incredible things uh-huh. um, related to agronomic science. And then uh, we developed an online academy called uh, academy.regen.ag. But you can find all of this together at johnkemp.com and also started writing a blog uh, that you can subscribe to there uh, at johnkemp.com with blog posts. I try to publish five or six posts a week when mm-hmm. I'm able to and not traveling too much and um, short, hopefully valuable, insightful. People are telling me that they really like them. Mm-hmm. Now you speak across the country too. So where can they find that list of that? Is that on that website as well? Um, not yet, but it will be soon. Okay. Yeah. Cause I know hearing you in person and just getting that interaction is, is always great. So, well, John, you have been a delight to have on again. Um, you know, I leave a lot of these conversations and I go tell my wife, you know, I thought I was doing good. I thought I was, you know, at least had a grasp on a topic. And then I talked to somebody who actually knows what they're talking about. So, um, I really appreciate you coming on, being willing to share your knowledge, um, and educate me. I mean, that's half the reason I do this podcast is I'm kind of selfish and I just want to learn so many new things. So, um, yeah, this is absolutely one that I am going to have to go back and to listen again myself, just because of all the ways you put things and, um, just the depth of, of knowledge that you kind of just exude. Well, thank you, Michael. Thanks for having me on. Hey, Thriving Farmers. Next week's podcast is a special one with Javan Bernakovich. And he is a regenerative designer and just life coach that lives in British Columbia, Canada. And it's a fabulous interview. Can't wait to share it with you. So make sure you join us next week to hear all about life design and just thriving as a farmer. I think so much of he talks about is what we talk about every single week here on the show and just making sure that your life matches what you uh, dream it to be. So there you have it, another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer Podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.